Start. Let's see. Hey. <laughs> All right. Kier, what is up, man? Yo. How's it going? It's going good. It's going good. Um, I just moved, so uh, just been like unpacking and settling in. So, you know, how are you? Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, man. Good. Thank you so much, first and foremost, uh, for taking the time today. This is so sick, man. I uh, really appreciate having you on and digging into some of the stuff that we're going to today. Uh, this is going to be fun, man. I can't wait. Yeah, no, I'm stoked. So yeah. let, let, me, let me start with this as far as, so here on Growing On You Live, I start with a, an initial introduction question, and then the remainder of the interview is about you and your craft. We're going to be digging into your bands, uh, you know, personal interests music-wise, and then we have one finale question. Uh, so first off, let me ask you, you know, in growing up and moving, you know, London, Boston, New York, Toronto, different spots, what, what is a place that comes to mind that was a favorite local eatery to you? You know, it could be in any of these places, maybe even something recently that you would recommend if my wife and I were traveling through, uh, through that particular spot? Um, well, Toronto, I think, is probably the best food city that I've ever been to. Okay. Um, it's okay. got, like, such a diverse range of stuff. Um, and honestly, my favorite place every time I go back is this time. Well, there's actually a chain called Gazal, and it's, like, a Lebanese tiny little place. Like, you just walk in, and they make it fresh. And uh, it's, like, you can't even sit down. I think there's, like, a, one seat or something. Um, <laughs> okay. that's my favorite spot honestly like I would just recommend every time I go home it's the first place I eat so yeah sweet <laughs> okay is there is there a particular dish that you go that like you can't you can't try anything else like it's just that thing that you have oh I mean their samosas are insane their falafel is insane I'll get a shawarma honestly anything like all their sides too like wrap grape leaves stuff and I just love I love like Middle Eastern food it's one of my favorites so yeah Dang, nice, nice. Okay, awesome, awesome. Cool, cool. Yeah, my, my, and my wife and I do, you know, some traveling too, so it's kind of, it, it's fun as far as having different, you know, different people from, I have people from out of the states, you know, people from, you know, different states surrounding and, and hearing different local, you know, favorite spots. I mean, as far as when we do some traveling, I, I, I love hearing that stuff. So I appreciate that. Sick, man. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, yeah. So, so yeah. start, yeah. <laughs> so, so starting off, you know, uh, initially, I wanted to dig into you know, your, your musical interests. You know, we have we have Whelm, we have Phalanx. We're going to dig into to some of that. But, you know, with, with your parents, uh, you know, being, you know, a little bit more flexible, uh, you know, when you were younger at, li you know, whatever you're listening and, and watching, tell us about early songs, albums, or bands that made an impression on you even before heavy music came into the picture. Well, my house was just like constant music. Um, my dad worked... Uh for record labels and distribution and stuff. And so we just had like oh, wow. walls, walls of CDs, like, you know, so there was music always playing um, and, and a huge range of stuff, like from, you know, jazz, uh, country. My dad was a big country fan. Um, so I grew up on like Hank Williams and um, a lot of stuff like that. But he also liked punk. And then, you know, punk, I think, was the first stuff that really, I don't know that I gravitated towards, like, otherwise I kind of just, whatever was playing was great. But, uh, when I heard like early punk stuff, like the clash and the buzzcocks and, um, okay. stiff little fingers and stuff like that, like the more melodic stuff, but it was kind of simple and catchy. Um, and I really related to that. And that kind of obviously then led me to like heavier stuff, but. Yeah. Okay. What was it like, a, was it an initial kind of, was there something aesthetically, you know, as far as like sonically that drew you to it? Was it vocals? Was it, you know, the, the, the rhythm of it, you know, the fast pacedness of it, you know, kind of the anxiousness. Was there anything in particular that really drew you with that once, you know, kind of uh, hearing punk? I think it was just the overall energy, like, and, and that is a combination of, yeah, the vocals, the rhythm section. I liked how simple it was. I wasn't into guitar solos or anything like that. Like, I really just wanted it, like, really <laughs> okay. boiled down. Yeah, no, I, like, used to hate metal, too. Like, I think Slayer was the first band that I finally was like, okay, um, but I really just wanted it nice. simple and like accessible and just more about a feeling than technical, like a technical skill level. Um, now that's changed obviously, but yeah. Yeah. So, I, and I think that's something too with, you know, with punk and then transitioning into hardcore, you know, within the eighties there where that was kind of the thing where it was like the energy and the push to it, you know, like that's what you're going to get. It's not going to be a whole lot of solos or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, shiny and, and polished shit in a sense. <laughs> yeah, I like stuff that I could like follow along to. And then that's the thing. And then my, my dad, I remember uh, he was like, oh, well, you like this punk stuff. So you might like Mindy Threat and like Bad Brains. He gave me some CDs yeah. and I put my my Walkman on the way to school. I'd ride, ride the bus and I was like, oh shit. Like the first time I heard Mindy Threat, I was like, what the, f it, 
was so fast and just like <laughs> you know so like you know boiled down and then of course like bad brains weirdly enough got me kind of into metal and stuff because they really did have incredible guitar work and solos and stuff like that and but yeah those bands really just kind of like took it to the next level for me nice nice okay you you mentioned walkmans and that you know brings us back to a time as far as you know the struggle of you know put popping in a cd and just hoping to god that it didn't skip you know did, did you have any 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 sort of special you know things that you would have to just make it so that the, the, that one song wouldn't skip you know as far as maybe even trying to hold it a certain way or was that struggle there on your end too yeah i would like hold it up like this on the bus like just hold it <laughs> level and uh yeah i mean and i was like it was funny because i was so late to like i've always been really late to technology this is my first time on a live stream for example and i you know even oh, everyone wow. had everyone had ipods already and i was like that kid who still had like the little booklet of cds that i would bring to school and everyone's like what the hell like what era do you live in dude and then i think i got, <laughs> I got a, an ipod shuffle as a gift on the first tv show i did in america and they gave me like one of those little shelf like shitty little shuffles and i was like oh my god i can i could put up on 100 tracks on this or whatever and that, <laughs> yeah, like, right. yeah i was so cool at the time to me did you have some go-to CDs in that catalog that you always had to have on hand? Um, I mean, yeah, Minor Threat. I had, like, some compilation ones that were, like, Hellcat. I remember I had, like, the Hellcat Records compilations. Oh, yeah, nice. So I had, okay. like, Rancid and Tiger Army and all, like, I don't know. Yeah, a bunch of stuff like that. Because my dad would get a lot of them, like, from friends, like, through work. Yeah. And so he would just be like, here's all this shit. And then that's kind of how I found more stuff, so... Okay. Okay. Did you, was, was there ever like a, a time as far as like with skating and kind of getting into, you know, getting into that and then discovering different music out of like some of those videos or even like Tony Hawk pro skater? Like, did you discover different bands from, from those alleys as well? Um, I kind of didn't like, cause I mean, I played those games, but I kind of already knew that stuff because again, my dad had showed me most of the, most oh, of yeah, that okay. stuff. Um, but, uh, and yeah, like skateboarding was never really a huge part of my life. Um, but okay. I hung out with a lot of skaters and they, of course, are just people who like the same music as me. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it always went hand in hand too. So I kind of wonder, I, you know, unfortunately I, I was, you know, in that, in that, uh, in that era as far as, you know, skating, but I always sucked. So it was like, it was only an amount of time where I was like, all right, I got to give this up and just, just enjoy the music. <laughs> I, hey, I respect it. I respect especially my friends who are still doing it at yeah. our age and who don't have health insurance. Like, I think it's <laughs> crazy. Right. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I love watching people do it. But, no, I'm not very coordinated, honestly. <laughs> okay. Uh, so at, at, a, at a young age, you created a community as far as, you know, uh, something of your own with the common ground of punk and aggressive music. Uh, tell us where some of the underground and independent, you know, past like the minor threats and different things like that. Did you have a certain, you know, group of friends that introduced you to bands that you weren't even aware of, you know, that might have been uh, uh, maybe out for a little while and, you know, just were that far under radar? Like, how did you how did you uh, learn, you know, more about different bands outside of the scope that you were initially introduced to? Well, for me, actually, like I didn't have any friends who were into punk. I had one friend in my school who liked punk and nobody else. Um, mm. really liked it and most people just like laugh at how I dress and stuff mm. um, and uh, so I just went to go to record stores and just buy CDs and okay. like you know just spend hours looking through and you know I would even like read the back of the CD and, or like an insert and it would say like thanks to these other bands like that they yeah. were with and so yeah. I'd like go through and be like oh, okay and then sometimes I try and find them on YouTube or whatever like if you could but then, you know, I'd go and like, okay, this they think this band, so let me see if they have that band. And it was like a, it was laborious for sure. Like, I don't know, people nowadays, like, <laughs> yeah. it's so easy, you know, like the algorithm just is like, oh, you like power violence, here you go. Um, but back then it was like, you know, and so a lot of record stores. And then when I moved to LA, you know, I started going to shows a lot. And I went to shows in Toronto too, but especially in LA. And then that's how I found a lot of bands was either seeing them play or, you know, I do also do a lot of, like, going to shows and, like, looking at people I thought were as cool as t-shirts and, like, trying yeah. to memorize, like, what shirts and patches people have and then go find them on my own. Um, so, like, that was, yeah, it was a very different time. But uh, I was kind of on my own with that. And then I finally kind of started making friends in the Toronto scene right when I moved to L.A. And then it took me a while and then I made a bunch of friends <laughs> of here. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, okay, okay. You, and you mentioned, in, you know, going through the, the record shops, you know, too, another big thing was always, like, the cover art. Uh, is there a story or a time that you remember, you know, scanning through the aisles and finding something solely off of the cover art? And uh, if so, what was that, and what about the cover drew you? Um, just funny, actually. I was just listening last night to uh, Citizen's Arrest, uh, Light in the Darkness, which is one of my all-time favorite Sick. Uh, punk EPs, and I remember, or hardcore, I guess, but that one was one where I was like, I thought it was like a black metal album or something from that cover <laughs> yeah. art, and I was like, oh, yeah. cool, and I was getting into black metal, and so I, I you know, like, I love that, like, just this, because they used, like, real paintings, I forget who painted that album cover, but I've always been attracted to, like, album art more so than, like, a live photo or whatever, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this looks fucking cool, it's, like, gonna be evil, and I put it on, and it wasn't really evil, but it was the most furious, like, it just right out of the gate that album just kicks ass it's got this like crazy youthful energy you know mm -hmm. like it's just so powerful and so yeah it was anyway that reminded me of like even last night i was just re-listening to it i was like oh man this this album's great but yeah that one was solely just because i thought the album art was cool um and it's become one of my favorite albums in hardcore dang okay nice nice that's that's a cool choice shit i haven't i haven't listened to that in a little while i'll have to go back and check that one out too uh, Check what, it out, yeah. yeah <laughs> what, uh, do you remember what was the first album or, or cassette tape or CD or whatnot that you bought with your own money? May it be, you know, a, a paycheck or an allowance that you had to save up. Do you remember what the first thing was that you bought? Oh, man. Well, that was the weird thing. So I had, like, I was working, you know, as a kid. I've been working since I was 10. So, mm -hmm. uh, but my parents were, like, really strict about letting me, like, if I booked a job, I could go like buy myself one thing um i'm trying to think what the first thing was it's probably kind of embarrassing uh now but, <laughs> uh fuck i think it was maybe some street punk thing i don't know probably some street punk thing okay yeah maybe the okay. unseen nice. it was like the unseen or something like that yeah nice right. okay yeah i mean that's not too too shabby you know no, I, no, I remember it's going not that to bad. a shop and yeah. I went to go buy something and I, I was trying to rack my brain on what it exactly it was. And I ended up buying a, a, a VHS copy of the nutty professor. I didn't even get a damn <laughs> album. So, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. So That's I, pretty cool, I came though, out too. completely opposite. <laughs> uh, uh, so as far as like with, with, you know, from being a fan of music and, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, in, an interest in buying albums and listening and things, where does the transition come into the idea as far as playing? Was uh, what, in, in, And being a vocalist in a band, was that initially the idea or did you play instruments before? Uh, I played drums before. I tried doing vocals um, and I've always wanted to be in a band, but it's so hard when you're like, you know, when you're working for you know, you're going around to different places and working for three months here and you come back and people are like, hey, I, I mean, I screwed around on bass a bit first. And okay. then, uh, but I really like drums. And I think it was like, actually that game Rock Band, where I was like, yeah. this is really fun, you know? Like, I really enjoyed the drumming part. And so then uh, I looked at a house and had a drum kit. And so I started drumming. And I really liked that. Um, and then, uh, but as far as doing vocals, I my friend Sean, I had just met him and he was like, oh, you know, he just moved out from Philly. Uh, to LA and he was like yo I'm starting like a crust band in LA like do you want to try doing vocals and I was like sure you know why not <laughs> um, so I went in and just tried out and they were like eh. he was like if we keep working at it it might be alright and there was no other options really like, nobody wanted to be in our band nobody wants to be in well and we had like a really hard time <laughs> locking down members um, so yeah that's that's how we started that band okay when when you were discovering uh, of vocals and, and singing, were there particular albums or styles that you were kind of working along with as far as, you know, just practicing by yourself? Uh, were there things that, you know, that, that stood out as far as that you um, tried, in, not embodying, because I don't want to say like copying, but in a sense of like kind of practicing along, you know, and in, 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 in honing your own craft? I mean, for me, it's got to be like, I just kind of worship Dylan Walker from Full of Hell. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, and I think to this day, no one can touch him, like, vocally, um, and uh, his range is insane, and I remember, you know, I'd seen them, I would see them every time they came anywhere I was, um, and just his, like, insane range on stage from, like, he does, like, screams that are so high, and then, like, you know, he'll switch right back and forth, like, and so he was always kind of the model for, like, I wanted to have range yeah. like that. 
and I wanted it to be really interesting. Yeah. And I would watch videos of him. I'd watch like eight, five, six videos and even just sort of like look at like how he would move his jaw and like, you know, he was practicing his breathing and stuff. And so he was a huge influence for that. And I mean, less so trying to necessarily copy him, although I definitely think their similarities. It was more just like I wanted to have that kind of range. And so in both Whelm and Phalanx, like I really try and keep it super interesting and switch it up any chance we get. And like that's something as well that Sean's always, you know, uh, he plays guitar in both bands and does backing vocals. We were always just like, let's keep it, the vocals super interesting. We go back and forth. I'll do a high here. You come in with a low here. Let's go at the same time here. So um, I think vocals are really important. And uh, I wasn't, I didn't want to just be a vocalist. I wanted to really push it and see what I could do. Yeah, sick. Okay. Well, and now, so this was, well, was like, that started in 2017, right? 2016, 2017, around there? Yeah, but it took forever to like, Again, nobody wants to be in our band, so it took, like, forever. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. We went through, like, seven, seven bass players and two drummers, and, like, we just thought we were never going to get the demo out, and so we just finally did the demo, put it out, and then got a bass player and then started playing. I think oh, it was okay. Rough. Yeah. Okay. Now, so so you have a couple of years past, you know, say three or four years past. Uh, what are some learning curves as far as, you know, from first starting out singing and, and, and you know, taking that on to now that you know that you apply as far as maybe before going out for a show or before recording uh what are some things that you've taken in uh taken in from those earlier experiences well one i think is like knowing when to stop and like it's better to call like call it off and like do a short set if you feel your voice you know going mm. uh okay. that's something i learned the hard way losing my voice a lot um and um also even that you know you I, getting a good night's sleep i know it sounds lame but like getting a good night's sleep beforehand eating i hate eating before playing because i'm nervous but you gotta eat like so i try and eat something like really hearty early also something that's not spicy because i have <laughs> almost shit myself before um <laughs> like a couple of times um oh, if your no. heart rate is going and you're jumping around and whatever um but yeah you know stay hydrated <laughs> Uh, all that stuff that I, I learned kind of the hard way, you know, um, almost fainting a couple of times on stage, especially like one time we played in Arizona, it was outside in, in like July. And uh, yeah, I think we all were, we like called the set short because we were just like, we're going to die. Um, oh, damn. So yeah, but you know, just taking care of yourself, I guess. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's kind of one of those things too, where I, I'm always interested in the earlier times with those things, because, you know, it, it's a, it's that developmental stage as far as, you know, kind of getting into it. And, you know, you, you feel like you're the only one where it's like, why am I only nervous? And why am I, you know, and you talk to like so many other different you know, musicians and things like that. It's like people literally have puked on themselves or shit themselves, you know, actually, you know, and so it's like, okay, yeah, I didn't do too bad. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm all right. But, you know, it, it, more or less, I mean, musicians in general, you know, everybody has a different way of processing things. So it's always cool to hear, you know, some of the earlier, uh, earlier times with that stuff I, I love that um i wanted to dig into next as far as you know uh, before kind of getting into your career with acting and different things your your role in the the video for gate creepers desperation how did that come about and uh you know uh, just tell us about filming that bad boy so sick oh yeah um so i had gone to see gate creeper they were like touring with a feather and bone um, and they, I oh, went out okay. to Pomona to see them and nobody was there. It was the weirdest thing. It was like right before Gate Creeper really broke. Um, okay. I also just don't think anyone promoted the show cause I was like, where is everybody? But so it was like basically just 20, 25 people watching them. And then afterwards I went to buy merch from them and talked to Chase, I think a little bit. And I could see him kind of like clocking who I was maybe, but being confused, which I think a lot of people do in like the metal scene. They, they assume like, are you in a band or something? But um, then he ended up, I guess they talked about it after, and they were like, yo, that was the kid from It Follows, and uh, who was at the show. And then, so they, like, I was already following, I don't know, Chase on Instagram or something, so he, like, followed me back and was like, hey, would you want to do this video, like, in a couple weeks uh, for our new album? And I was like, yeah, hell yeah. I was like, just give me some shirts, and I'll be there, you know? Um, <laughs> and, uh, Sick. Yeah, and then he was like, okay, our buddy Dylan, Dylan Vaughn, who directed and shot the whole thing was he's like oh, he's gonna pick you up you're gonna come to phoenix i didn't really know any of them um okay. but uh yeah just got out there and we basically just started shooting like we spent all night in phoenix just running like in the fucking really hottest 
another Arizona story. It's so <laughs> hot there. Um, we're just running around uh, all night. It was like all this crazy stuff kept happening. Saw like the craziest bar fight I've ever seen. Like literally saw a guy like take out seven, six or seven people. Just like, <laughs> and we're all just standing there on the street watching this happen. And then uh, the next day they were playing with uh, Dragon to Sunlight, uh, <laughs> Primitive Man, and Cult Leader in Tucson. So we drove down to Tucson, and oh, that's where dang. we shot the actual performance. And so they just played the song two or three times. They just, like, told everybody, hey, you know, um, we're going to play the song a couple times. And so I would just go around and, like, stage side and then, like, run around to the back of the venue. And Dylan would be waiting for me and go and do it again and again and again. Uh and uh, a bunch of people thought I was actually, like, bleeding out. Um, people were like, some kid. some kid got stabbed, and he's, like, running around. Um, and, uh, but, yeah, that was, like, super fun. And then we just shot some more that night. But it was, like, very running gun, which was awesome. And, like, Dylan did such a great job with it. And, you know, um, it was very much just like, hey, uh, this looks cool. Run over there. You know, uh, do this, do that. And it was really kind of liberating and freeing because so much of, like, shooting in film and TV is just waiting around and like waiting around oh, and like okay. you know sometimes it's i mean it's usually hours before you even like get a shot off so to do something like that was that just like crazy was was really fun um i had a great time and we became Damn. really good friends and we've been friends ever since like with all those all those dudes so sick that is so cool i mean and it was one of those things too that might have been it might have been a little bit before then that i realized that you were in a band and had done different things too but seeing that video i'm like what the fuck? Like, what is the connection here? Like, this is so sick, you know? So I mean, kind of going back and retracking. And then uh, you mentioned as far as, you know, the kind of difference with, you know, shooting that as opposed to, you know, television and film I was going to ask about, but, you know, you saying, you know, kind of the, the fluidness of it and the kind of, you know, continuity of it, just keeping it going and getting it done. Uh, was that over just one day that you guys filmed then? It was two nights. Yeah. And I think we finished, oh, it, two at nights. Like, okay. we finished at like 4 a.m. on the like, the second night, like, we just went out and shot even more and came back. And, like, I think, yeah, it was, like, the sun was coming up. And the Dragged Into Sunlight dudes were, like, still, uh, they were still just, like, hanging out outside the hotel, like, partying. <laughs> we, like, hung out. We hung out with them for a bit. Um, but, yeah, like, uh, yeah, that was that was so much fun. And it was pretty dope because I also got to see, yeah, Primitive Men, Dragged Into Sunlight, and Cult Leader, as well as Gate Creeper, and to shoot a whole video. So that was a blast. Sick. Yeah, that rules. Damn, that's awesome. I, I, I love hearing that, too. I, I've, I've yet to see Gate Creeper, uh, but uh, I, I can't wait to check those guys out because, man, they have such a sick energy. And the album that they got coming out and everything, too, they got, they got some cool stuff going on. Oh, yeah, they're awesome. Like, I've seen them a bunch of times, and they're always perfect. Like, it's exactly what you want, so... Sweet, yeah. <laughs> sweet. Uh, with uh, so uh, transitioning into into film, first I wanted to dig into you know some earlier interests as far as from yourself, uh, you know, and, and early, you know, tell us about earlier television or movies that may have made an impression on you, and you know, maybe even if it was a character or or, or a score from a film, what were earlier things that that you remember having an interest in film or TV wise? Um. I mean, I, we watched everything. Like, as much as my parents were into music, they also were so into film. Um, you mm. know, uh, like, everything. We had so many DVDs. Um, we had, like, just endless movies to watch of all kinds. And I, I, even as a little kid, I think my first favorite movie was The Land Before Time, which my mom always thought Oh, was yeah. It would make me cry every time. Like, I would just be sobbing. <laughs> and she'd come in and be like, oh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'd be sobbing, and, and, I, and every single day I'd be like, can I watch Land Before Time again? And my mom was like, are you sure? Because you're just going to cry. And I just, I think I love, <laughs> I love heartbreaking stuff. And another weird movie, like, my, I watched a lot of unconventional stuff. Like, I didn't really watch any Disney movies. I still haven't seen most of them. Um, hmm. But I, 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 a funny one was, uh, I, have you ever seen uh, Jan Spunkmeier? Is this really weird Eastern European director, and he did a movie called Alice, which is his rendition of Alice in Wonderland, and it's super weird. Like, okay, got that right that. there. Okay, so we're gonna that's... be touching on that, sir. We're gonna be touching on that. Okay, that's All a right. deep cut. That's the Alice in Wonderland <laughs> I grew up with. I didn't okay. know there was another one, and I went to someone's house, and they were like, "Want to watch Alice in Wonderland?" And I was like, "Sure." And they put on this stupid cartoon, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. I was like, this sucks, dude. Like, the you know, the proper one is at home. And 
Uh, so I would watch all kinds of weird. I was like at age whatever, very young. So weird mm-hmm. stuff like that. And then I mean, even I would watch like film noir with my parents, and oh, okay. you know they were always yeah. I, I think my parents said I could sit through like the Maltese Falcon at like you know age six or something like that. And uh, I was they were always like super all about don't talk during a movie. And like my dad took me to see Jurassic Park, I think, when I was like two or something. And uh, I was just like <laughs> shushing everybody in the theater. Like we were in the lobby, and I was like sitting on his shoulders and just going like, shh, shh, shh. like no, <laughs> no talking in the movie theater. And um, just this little like, little English kid just shushing everybody. Um, so uh, yeah, so the films just always. I don't know if there's even one single one, but it's just like always tons of movies, and it all kind of just influenced me in different ways um so yeah lots of I, stuff i i love that now with with those interests did this develop any sort of further interest as far as like collections from toys or comic books or anything like that you know were, were there any you know any specific uh genre or maybe even just a, a show or movie that you had to have every figure of something um i collected like a lot of I mean, yeah, toys for sure, like tons of action figures, um, and like, uh, I think I did like all the Lord of the Rings figures and all that stuff, and then I got really into, I mean, yeah, I'm a huge, I still collect a lot of graphic novels, um, I love it because it's kind of like reading a storyboard, um, I think, you know, uh, and I, I don't really like comic, I don't like superheroes. <laughs> But I collect every, like, image comic, and uh, I'm, like, always reading graphic novels. Um, nice. So, yeah, I, I definitely, and I collect vinyl, and, you know, I've tried to be better about it, though. Like, I just, I'm sick of, like, being, living buried under stuff. So <laughs> I've kind of slowed down on my collecting a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I've always been kind of like that. My family are all collect. Like I said, we have walls of CDs and DVDs. Right. And, yeah, <laughs> right. all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So anything as far as music or movies wise, you didn't really have to collect because it was already there. Basically, that's the thing. I didn't have to. <laughs> yeah, it was like my dad would just come home from work and be like, "Here's all this stuff. Like, check this out. Enjoy." So yeah. I had it really easy, <laughs> really easy. Um, so yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and I, I've heard a little bit of this, but I wanted to, you know, ask as far as digging into where did horror come into, into the picture, you know, where, where maybe an earlier watch or, uh, you know, something that really stuck with you initially. I mean, I, I can't remember what the first horror movie, I was probably too young. I mean, I'm the one, the first one that scared the shit out of me was Ringu. Um, mm, okay. And I, I think I walked out of that one. I was like, I can't. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, Dawn of the Dead, really. I think that was the first one I loved, and I would just watch over and over. Nice. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I always loved horror, and my parents too, like, you know, it was, you know, we were, we were not very sheltered in that regard. It was like, whatever you want to watch, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. When, so as far as like visiting a local video shop too, or going somewhere and being able to rent videos, uh, you know, having that experience, was there anything, you know, that, that comes to mind as far as uh, a movie cover that just jumped out to you that was something that you weren't familiar with and you had to check out? And if so, did the, the, the cover match up with the, the movie, you know, the quality? Was the movie actually good or did it suck? Um, wow, well, yeah, I used to go every, every basically opportunity. Like, I'd go to uh, Suspect or Queen Video or these two rental places that I don't, I don't think they exist anymore. Um, but I would just get everything. Um, one that's kind of funny was I remember I, I picked up Feast. Oh, and yeah. I like, yeah okay. I, I was like, this looks, you know, like just gore fest, cool, whatever. Because I like all kinds of horror. It didn't have to be like super intellectual or anything. Mm-hmm. And that, I was so surprised how fucking funny that movie was. Like, I mean, <laughs> me and my friends were like dying. We watched it over. I think we watched it like twice before I had to take it back. Um, I don't know, yeah, I, I, I grabbed everything, and almost funnier than that, too, like, I had a friend who would give me Burns DVDs that didn't have a cover, and so it was kind of fun, because it would just be Sharpie written on it, and it would be stuff you couldn't find, like Cannibal Holocaust, and like, Oh all this yeah. Stuff. and I remember he gave me one, he goes, this one's really rough, and it just said the Serbian film, and I was like, what? Oh. I know, and we don't have to get into it, but I would, that was like kind of a funny op- opposing thing where I was like, cool, that doesn't sound too bad. Like, threw that DVD in and it just ruined my life. <laughs> oh, no. I was like, it, it just, oh. I was with like two friends and we just were like, that, that was kind of the end of me just like trusting 
this person to just give me stuff. But yeah. <laughs> Boy, yeah, you gotta you gotta start wondering if you can trust that person anymore. You're like, you bastard. What did I you mean, send me into? <laughs> he kind of said like, yo, this one's rough, but I was like, okay, whatever. But it's funny because like on the opposing, like not having covers, you're just like, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, and I, I think I, I had heard you mention too, you know, it, it's funny as far as I feel like it's everybody. And I, I felt like I was so alone. And, you know, my, my couple of buddies that we were all into horror, when initially getting into it, it's like you want to find the more extreme stuff. You want to find the things online, you know, the lists that are in forums of like the, 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 the most, you know, wild things that you're ever going to see, you know. And then it gets to like movies like that where it's like, oh, okay. I, I know my limit now. I know where that top tier is, and I don't. I don't want to be there. <laughs> and I think Serbian film is that for a lot of people. Like I, that was where I was like, yeah, that was a boundary that I was like, I'm never crossing this again. Yeah, but also, I, it was like a different time. I think people don't realize like now, like we were always like looking at all this awful stuff, like Rotten.com and like all this terrible. Yeah, like, we just yeah. wanted to see all this like, oh, we'll see a real snuff film and all this stuff, and so like. Yeah, you, you, you push it at first, and then you get to a point where it's like, okay, <laughs> like, that's enough. Um, so, yeah. 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 Yeah, too 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 far, too far. Yeah, the, the, uh, you mentioned that Feast movie. Was that the movie that was, it was made out of the uh, Project Greenlight, the TV show? Am no, it was like this, it's, it's this really silly movie. Like, it's like a bar in the desert, and these aliens come, and they're just, like, killing everybody, and there's, like, a lot of alien dicks in it and stuff like that. And, like, <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah I, like do you, do you remember like, that show or no? No, I don't. I didn't. Yeah. I, again, I just picked up that movie and just like ran with it. And then I know there was a piece two and three and they were also hilarious. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I if I, I could be wrong, but I think there was a TV show on HBO called Project Greenlight and they would hire on like a whole cast of like a director, DP, writers, all these different people to make like a, a short film or to make a movie. And the final like episodes of the show are like, you know, depicting the, the final movie. And I feel like Feast was one of the movies that they actually made from that show. Oh, that's crazy. I had no idea. That's awesome and really dope. And HBO is always doing cool stuff like that. Yeah, so I, I love them. I'll have to go back and look just to make sure that if, I, if this is completely incorrect, that I'm going to edit out all this shit. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was, that, was, that was one of those movies. It was really cool, too. Uh, yeah. And I do remember the movie, but uh, let, let's dig into three scenes. So three scenes from any movies, you know, any, uh, even maybe even outside of horror that are just forever ingrained in your brain. Things that you saw and after you saw them, you're like, well, I can't ever forget that. What, uh, what would be three scenes that would be in this category? Um, well, the blood scene in The Thing is forever, I think, the scariest and most tense and most incredible scene in horror like you know <laughs> just yeah. just you know the scraping the little uh like hot wire in the blood yeah. and just and just it's like excruciatingly long um <laughs> and it just builds the tension and then of course if you've seen this it just you know goes to hell and there's a crazy fucking prosthetics and the head crawling across the floor i will never ever forget a set a single second of that and i watch that movie every <laughs> single year yeah. like i watch it once a year it's like a tradition um, that's the perfect horror movie for me, and that scene is my favorite. Nice. Um, and uh, another one from horror that's like on the silly side would be uh, like Tokyo Gore Police. Oh yeah. When yeah. when uh, when he gets his legs chopped off and starts like flying around, like they become like jet packs of blood. And he starts <laughs> flying around the room with his legs cut off, um, just because that's like hilarious visually. Um, and then. Uh, Another scene from another movie, maybe not horror. Um, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know any scene from Alice. Like now that I'm thinking about that movie, I, I just visually like you can't forget a single frame of that. Uh, yeah. So especially like just her, her like walking through that like depressing field of mud. Yeah, and there's the yes. cupboard, and she goes in like, or at the beginning when the rabbit, you know pulls itself out of the thing like i always love stop motion and and stuff so yeah i don't yeah, know which so... scene but any scene from that <laughs> nice i love that i love that uh one one movie you mentioned in tokyo gore police uh that same director he did a movie called anatomia extinction you ever heard of that one yeah i think i watched it at some point oh, maybe half of it or something yeah oh that movie is cool i i was just recently uh introduced to it through uh, it's like a newer a Blu-ray release, and they're 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 focusing on like that type of uh, 
uh, Asian horror and, 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 and different, you know, things kind of alike. And uh, that was their first release. And man, that movie was so cool. I, I absolutely, and I've always loved Tokyo Gore Police too. So I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to be too bummed out. And man, that movie was sick. That movie is awesome. If you haven't gotten to check it out, it's a good one. I think I may have started it and I need to give it another shot. So I will definitely do that. The, the same insanity that you get from Tokyo Gore Police. That's like, you get it, you know, maybe 20 minutes or so. And you start seeing just that same type of approach. And it's like, okay, this is like Evil Dead meets... I don't way sillier shit going on. <laughs> yeah, I love that stuff too. Like, I think that's the, the crazy part too. Is like, I think there's like people are very divided in horror, whether you like like art house, super smart horror, or you like gore stuff. And I'm somewhere in the middle. Like, I mm -hmm. just think there's value in all of that, and 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 those kind of movies are more of comedy for me anyway. You know. Yeah, so. yeah, totally, totally. Uh, breaking into you know your acting as far as so you you mentioned that the age ten. Did you say ten or eleven? I'm sorry. Ten. Yeah. Okay, so at the age of 10, which is, I mean, absolutely crazy, you know, you broke in, into acting and having roles at a young age and, and developing, uh, you know, did any of these roles or any movies, you know, that you watched at a young age develop irrational fears? You know, anything that, you know, now that you're a little bit older, you're like, why the hell was I scared of that? And, uh, you know, how did you get over those things, if, if so? Um, I mean, I used to be, like, really scared of the dark, obviously. Um, okay. And I had this weird fear that if I, like, went to sleep, I would die. And then, like, not be able to, I just wouldn't wake up. And so I would, like, stay up and just try and stay up all night. Like, I was like, I'll just beat it, you know. I'll get till tomorrow. And, uh, and I eventually just, like, pass out from exhaustion. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, now I don't fear the dark. I, like, don't, I don't, I'm not scared of ghosts. Like, I, honestly, n none of that kind of stuff. But one that kind of has always, and maybe it's not irrational, is, like, I always just, like, the beginning of Dawn of the Dead, like when society was collapsing, you know, it's like oh, yeah. things are shutting down. Um, it's that last ditch effort. Like, you know, the TV broadcasts are, are going down and stuff. That's always stuck with me and still kind of freaks me out. And uh, just the idea of society collapsing and even kind of the beginning of the pandemic sort of felt. Dude, I was just going to say know, that. Like, every, and you know what? In a weird way, too, I kind of was uh, sort of getting off on it a little, like just in terms of like kind of living out this fantasy where I was like, oh, shit, like everything shut down and oh no, flights are being <laughs> grounded and like a virus is like tearing apart, you know, the world. And I mean, it's awful, but it was like, some part of me was like, oh my God, this is like, it's like the beginning of Dawn of the Dead, you know, it was just, it felt like maybe this is it. Um, and yeah, that's kind of always like, that one sticks with me with like this feeling of like things starting to sort of collapse and the fabric of like society kind of crumbling away. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. Uh, and, and watching movies like that or seeing, you know, something like the original Dawn of the Dead, you know, when the initial pandemic, you know, started and that all started happening, did you kind of feel like you were, like, prepared? Like, I know what to do here. I think I'm going to make it out of this shit, you know, no matter what. I kind of did. I was like, okay. <laughs> well, I, was like, I was like, well, we, you know, I mean, we got to get somewhere remote. We need water and, you know, whatever, you know, food and fuel. I mean, I didn't I – re I refused to go run to the grocery store and fucking – load up on toilet paper and all that dumb shit. I was like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just out of principle. I was like, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, no, I did in a weird way feel a little prepared for that. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I just remember like when all that started happening, obviously like it's tragic and so much loss and not to make a joke out of it, but you know, out of trying to make light out of the dark situation, you know, it's like, man, where's the closest mall? You know, let's let's see. Uh, hopefully, maybe if there's one that's shut down, even if uh, you know, if 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 all else fails, we'll just go to that bad boy and try to figure out a you know a shelter type situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and again, like totally agree with you. Like, you know, there was, I mean, at a certain point, it was like, of course, I was like, this is terrible, this is awful, this is preventable, and like, um, this is like so awful. But at the same time, part of me was just like, is this like that thing that I always you know fantasized about as a kid? Like, is this gonna be a survival situation? And like. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you do a lot of thinking when you're also just like locked inside with nothing yeah. to do. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so as far as your roles, I wanted to dig in first uh, into the anthology Tales of Halloween. And uh, tell us about the, the, the track that's playing in your short. Uh, you have uh, Sac Village BC. Now, uh, tell us about did you were you aware of that band before that song is playing during during the chase scene there? Uh. No, I wasn't actually, but um, oh, okay. I didn't know we were even going to have like uh, 
heavy song in there, I don't think. I don't think. So oh, long okay. Time, this was a long time ago. But I, so Paul, the director, we also did Dark Summer together. Yep. Before that, um, Paul saw it. He's, well, he's a hardcore dude from Boston mm-hmm. and he used to play in bands. Um, and so we always kind of like had that. And then I think it was Josh Ethier, the editor, who put that song in. And he's like a huge metalhead. Uh, oh, and, like, sick. Hardcore dude. Yeah, like he, you know, so that was cool. Doing that was kind of cool. It was like the first time I'd ever worked with like multiple people who were into the same stuff. Um, okay. And so I wasn't, I wasn't surprised when I was like, oh, okay, we got a banger in, in, the, in the, you know, in the short. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, it, and it's funny too. I mean, hearing, hearing any sort of aggressive music, you know, a lot of times you're almost used to like an old school WCW wrestling like intro for a wrestler where it's just kind of this generic thing, you know, and I remember watching that and then hearing that part and I'm like, holy shit, what band is this? Like, I, I, I mean, it sounds sick. I just have no idea what it is. So, I mean, that's always cool too, kind of an Easter egg as far as like having the interest of film and then a certain band that, you know, sounds sonically like something you're into. It's like, well, I got to check this shit out. This is sick. And it's rare. I mean, it's happened a little bit more. I love uh, as well. Like, I don't know if you saw the art of self-defense, um, but, uh, Riley Stearns, the director, who's a friend of mine, like hmm. he used his bullet hell a couple times in that movie. Um, and he's really oh, metal as oh, well. Okay. I know what you're talking really, about. In a really clever way where like, you know, again, usually it's just, you would imagine that, but he, he uses it in this weird way where like, he's slowing the frame rate while playing this fast. So it's like slow motion with like this blisteringly fast bullet hell song. Um, Sick. that's a really interesting use of that too. Um, but yeah, it's it's starting to I, I see it a little more here and there. Like I see like a song and I'm like, oh cool. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. I'm gonna have to check that out. And I feel like I do remember hearing something about it because of Full of Hell being in it. Um that's the that's the one thing that, that does ring about it. But I'm gonna have to go and check that out too. It, it's uh is, is it from like twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen? A few years ago, right? It's a few years old, yeah. Um, yeah. okay. I think and not that old though. It's great. I mean, I love that movie, and Riley's incredible. Like he's so talented, um, cool. and it's cool that he's again. I'm starting to finally meet like these people here and there who like this stuff, who are in film. So for so long, I never met anybody who even knew. Maybe they'd be like, "Oh yeah, Black Flag," but like, um, yeah, yeah right. it's, it's cool to see like more more people who are into this stuff, kind of you know, getting some uh, some attention. Yeah, for sure, for sure. With so touching on anthology films, you know, from from the different ones that you've seen over the years, what are three of your favorite shorts within any anthology horror movies ever? Um, I might. Let's see. I know. Okay, like first comes to mind is Imprint for Masters of Horror. The Takashi Miike. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That fucked me up. Like, oh my god. <laughs> it, like, I. It's horrifying. Uh, so crazy. <laughs> I think they didn't release it, actually, I think. It was not released on TV because they thought it was too extreme. Yeah. And it was, it was, in the it was just with the box set, set, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's, like, yeah. the craziest one, for sure. Like, insane. Um, mm. And then from that same series, I really liked Tales in the Witch House, which was, like, a Lovecraft uh, adaptation. Um, and I think... Who directed it? Someone awesome. Um, that hmm. one was really cool. I don't know if I remember that one. Okay. Yeah, it's, like, but this student, he's, like, living in a... He rents a room, and there's, like, a rat in the wall. And there's a baby next door. It's basically... Oh, this yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, okay, yep. That one was wild, like, visually. Um, I'm trying to think... I think I can only think of two that really, like, jump out. But, yeah, those two are definitely my favorite of any anthology. Nice, nice. I love that. Let me let me ask about uh, one one last thing. The very last frame of your short... You have all the blood just shot right in your face, yeah. and I, I should have said spoiler alert. But what, like, was it a cannon? Was it a bucket? How did that all just come right at you? Because it almost looks like it's a lot of force from far away or really close, and it hurt. <laughs> it was, it was a, like a little cannon thing, just right by the camera. Like the camera was here, and it was like protected, and then it was like right by the camera, and that was funny too. So we had only that night to finish the short, like it. It was like a two night shoot and the sun was coming up and like we were screwed. We hadn't gotten that shot yet. So there was, that was one take. Um, cause it would have taken way too long to like oh, clean wow. me off. So we basically just like fingers crossed. Cause then, like, you know, we were like, okay, if we don't get this, we're screwed. Um, and like, so that was one take. And so that reaction, 
where I start laughing is completely real. I just was like, that was the first time it had happened. And I was just like, <laughs> trying to keep it together. But oh I was God. just like, holy shit. But yeah, it was a, a very close <laughs> blast in the face. <laughs> oh man yeah i, I mean it's it just just the looks from it i remember like that was you know kind of the, the finale the final scene of that but i'm like god damn that looked like that hurt like that did not look very comfortable <laughs> oh yeah it went like into my eye you see it's in my eyeballs and, like, um, <laughs> yeah but i mean you know it's fine i like i love all that stuff you know for whenever we do horror like do it throw blood on me like whatever i like i love all that shit um yeah. So, you know, nice. and I don't mind being uncomfortable. The only thing I hate is water. Like, I hate working in water. Don't oh, like it. Okay. Don't, I get cold and I get, like, anxious and I don't like water. But anything else, like, throw blood on me, whatever. I love it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Nice. And that, next up, I wanted to dig in a little bit as far as, uh, you know, what, what shooting for It Follows. And you've mentioned a little bit of the experience of, of shooting the film as opposed to, you know, kind of the uncertainty of what the final product was going to be and different things. And maybe I, I'm just kind of paraphrasing that. That might not be exactly even what you fucking said. But uh, tell us about the, the shooting of that movie and, you know, just kind of the experience of, of shooting in Michigan. I live in Michigan. So, you know, I, I first of all, love that that was shot there uh, and fucking love that movie, too. So I can tell you're from Michigan. I can hear it. Um, yeah. For real? Uh, yeah, yeah. I know the accent. Like, you know. Um, oh, weird. You know, I have a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of friends from Detroit and, and, and Ann Arbor and stuff. Um, oh, okay. Wow. It's the vowels. It's the vowels. Um, but, uh, yeah. Huh. Uh, yeah, I love Michigan, too. And it was great because, you know, David Robert Mitchell, he's from Detroit. And yep. that was all his, you know, that's the actual park. It's like two blocks from his mom's house. Um, you know, all of that stuff was really personal to him. Um, and, uh, it was, it was a wild time to shoot in Detroit because, you know, I actually was there recently and it's changed a lot. I mean, this mm -hmm. is not incredible. Like I almost didn't recognize like little Caesars has just like <laughs> rebuilt the downtown. Um, yeah. Yeah. But at that time, Detroit was still pretty like, it was another world. I'd never been anywhere like that. Like I got there and I was like, oh shit, this is crazy. And I mean, it's insane. <laughs> like it's perfect for a, you know, for a horror movie. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and all these beautiful buildings that, you know, we were able to just shoot in and they're like, I'm like, what is this? They're like, oh, this is supposed to be a car plant. And now it's just, they just shoot the Packard plant or whatever. Which I also heard, I guess they had to knock down, which is very sad. Um, oh, but, wow. uh, yeah, um, it was a wild time. And honestly, I really liked the vibe of the people in Detroit too. Like, especially the people doing film there because it's not a big film place. You know, they get maybe one big, at the time, like one big film a year and, Mm -hmm. um, I really respected, like, how hard everybody hustled and, like, you know, because it's hard, I think, uh, working on a crew in a, in a small film city and, right. and, not, and not just, you know, moving to L.A. or New York or Chicago. Um, so that was really cool. And, yeah, I mean, we had a blast. Like, honestly, I turned 21 uh, the first week we were there, so... <laughs> Lots we of fun. <laughs> we, partied, we partied a lot. Um, and, you know, when you're 21, you can also literally, like, you know, wake up on three hours of sleep, which I often did because we'd be like partying till four and then, you know, wake up and go shoot <laughs> for 15, 16 hours. Um, Damn. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Like, uh, and we, yeah, had such a blast there. Definitely screwed around. Like there was like, we, I, I was being crazy. Like I remember I, uh, we were up in like some small town, like in Northern Michigan, like basically in Canada. And, uh, we were at this hotel and like, we just like party our last night in this hotel. And I actually barricaded Olivia Lucardi, uh, in her room. Like I built, like she went to bed early and I built an entire wall of like stuff. And so when she opened her door, it was just like completely blocked. Like we were just being, you know, like crazy, you know, like, I don't know, but that was really fun. And also just like an incredible experience, like working with, uh, David Mitchell and, you know, Mike Ulagas, the, uh, uh, DP, like the two of them are just like, it's wild being around them because they're both quiet, but they're just doing like genius shit all the time. And you're like, you know, yeah. I was like, Hey, what are you guys doing? And they're like, don't worry about it. So it's this weird thing where you, you kind of knew you were in the presence of greatness, but you didn't know what they were doing. Um, oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did that ever bring any sort of like uncertainty as far as like, was it ever a thing as far as, um, your performance? And, you know, you mentioned like, uh, did that suck? Like, should I do it again? And they're just like, ah, you know, and just kind of let it go. Or was that, was it, it that was, ever a thing at all? David was, like, very 
free about it. I mean, I basically play him in the movie. So we talked a lot, but it was always like, it was great mm. because he would go, you know, he'd go, uh, I'd say, hey, David, I don't really understand this. And he'd go, what do you think? And I'd be like, well, I think that he's doing this. And he goes, oh, interesting. Okay. And like, would walk away. So he, you know, I think... <laughs> He, trust, he trusted me a lot. He trusted all of us a lot. Um, yeah. But he was he was there. It was just like a very strange relationship. But I felt very secure. Like I knew that he would tell me if if I was really really off. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think the uncertainty was more so like, is this going to be scary? Is this ever going to come out? Like, you know, when you're working with a movie that's that low budget, you know, I've done stuff that you finish it and then it disappears for like four years. You know. And doesn't right. see a light of day, and uh, so yeah. But it was an incredible experience. Like I truly just, uh, I don't think I've ever before or after had any anything quite that uh, interesting film wise. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. You know, and and I can say I, I mean, I I tried making this to where I wasn't asking like. 90 questions and i have a ton you know a ton of different things too but i i do want to mention one that went under my radar um that you know kind of in my research i picked up on was window in the ground and man that story was oh crushing. castle in the ground like okay i'm jesus i'm sorry yeah, yeah, castle, yeah, yeah. castle in the ground yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah man and all the performances in that with alex and yourself and even nev like it was insane man i mean like some of the stuff that that you've been a part of that you know even with that movie not being horror you know there's certainly a lot of aspects where it's like, shit, man, this is some dark, hard material to dig into. But, uh, 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 you know, performances with stuff like that. I mean, certainly it, 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 that's cool. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the work even outside of horror that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think usually it's, it's, it's dark stuff, like regardless that I'm always attracted to. And, um, you know, like I get sent different stuff. And my, I think my reps, like my agents at times are just like, I'll be like, oh, I want to do this one. And they're like, really? Okay, another like, brutal movie that you know most people are not gonna be able to sit through and i'm just like yeah no i'm like that's that's the stuff i, I like i like really dark stuff like you know some of my favorite films are like i mean i always talk about too one of my favorite movies that it's not really a horror movie but it's like the most fucked up movie i've ever seen is a uh, come and see uh it's a russian film and like it's just excruciating okay. to watch but i like i'm it can't look away um hmm. yeah okay I don't, know. I don't think i've ever seen that before it's a it's a weird one. Uh, definitely check it out. If it, it's uh, about it takes place in Belarus during World War Two, and it's about a kid who joins like the resistance against the Nazis, and like apparently he was hypnotized during the shooting by the director, and like the performance is wild. Like this kid's face from the beginning to the end is just like he ages like forty years in the course of the movie. It's crazy. Check oh, it out. Yeah. come and see. You said it's called. Yeah, come and see. Damn. Okay. Yeah, I will have to check that out. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, I mean, and like another thing too, with within you know, a Castle in the Ground, there was you know, like seeing Alex Wolf and the, the 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 character and you know the part that he brings into it. I was just like, man, does this guy ever like get a role with just a normal fucking family that loves him? Like that poor dude. <laughs> he doesn't want him. He, he, he wants to push it. He's always pushing it. Like you know, and he you know had a whole process, and um, I guess. Yeah, it was like method kind of. So he was like yeah, sure. punishing himself in that movie. And like, um, yeah, I think he, he just, it's partially, I'm sure he could do stuff like that. But I mean, maybe, maybe much like me, it's just attracted to like really dark stuff and, yeah, you know, yeah. challenging stuff. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, and does great with it too, you know, but it's just like, man, this poor guy, like every time I see him, hereditary, uh, I don't know if you've seen old yet, but uh, I, I really yet, enjoyed that movie. And, you know, the role that he gets in that, you know, I won't bring up spoilers, but you know, kind of along the same the same stance. It's just like, man, this poor dude <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't catch no. a break. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> he gets he gets punished for sure. Yeah. I haven't seen it, uh, but I will check it out. Old. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I mean, I the one thing I can say, like with things kind of opening back up, uh, that I've uh, particularly you know taken part in is the theater. You know, I've really tried getting back out and seeing a lot of stuff that it, you know anything that I can in theater just because a, the, you know, the experience out of it, but B just as far as, you know, kind of getting the, the, the momentum driving back up and movies wanting to get back out. Cause you have some stuff just going straight to online, which is okay. And, you know, and, and cool, but you know, that experience of being in theater, I think is always one in a million, man. Yeah. I, uh, I still haven't actually gone. I wanted to go see the green Knight, but I, like I guess I've just been moving. So like, as soon as everything's been opening back up, I've also just had all this shit to do, but I cannot wait to get back to the theater myself. Like, 
it's been yeah, totally. way too long. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, I wanted to dig into this is the last thing here, and then I'm going to uh, have the, the old finale here. Uh, but a atypical, you know, digging into a little bit of this as far as uh, the, the TV show, you know, you had four seasons, a long run just recently ended. Uh, and you've touched on taking roles based on whether the script resonates with you after the initial read through. Uh, what about atypical resonated after that first read early on? Well, I mean, I think uh, one, I, I really love uh, dramedies and, and stuff that can kind of tread that line. I think it's really hard to have something that's both funny and heartbreaking. Um, and so I'm always just impressed whenever a script is able to pull that off at all. Um, and also just like Sam's character was just so fascinating and, you know, he's so honest and he's so... It, I, I saw a huge challenge there to like to bring this to life because it really was a very delicate balance of, of you know, that whoever was going to get that role because it wasn't like they offered it to me or anything. Um, mm. and, uh, and also that it wasn't like super precious, you know, I think like that Sam, you know, was, is flawed and, and, um, you know, I could tell even just from the pilot that like he was going to have probably not the easiest time over the course of the show and, um, you know, have some, some dark moments and, uh, yeah, it was just like such a, such a unique script that I just, you know, I was hooked immediately. Mm. Okay. Well, now, with this being a little bit, it was uh, over a course of, you know, some months, was there somebody else uh, as well that was, like, possibly, like, a, a side, uh, you know, uh, cast as far as, like, was it always that they had you, you know, uh, along for kind of doing read-throughs, or were there other people that were reading for the role as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just going... I mean, obviously, they read through, but... Yeah, no, I mean, we... I, I remember Jennifer was attached first, like, before I was. And then I auditioned like a bunch of times over months. And then uh, like there were different guys coming in, you know, we'd go in over and over and then I got it. And then I think by the time we did the read through, everyone was set uh, for the cast. And like, once we all read through together, that was the set cast. I don't think anyone oh, okay. changed. Uh, the funniest though is that Nick Todani, who plays Sahid, mm -hmm. has been a friend of mine for years and he didn't tell me that he got the part or that he was up for it or anything. So that oh, first wow. read through, he like walks to the door, and I'm like, "What the fuck are you doing here, dude?" And he was like, "Dude, I'm playing Zahid," and I was like, "Dude, like, why did, <laughs> why did you hit, hit me up? Like, you know, you could have hit me oh up. I would have like put in a good word for you or whatever." And he's like, "No, I didn't. You know, I just wanted to get it on my own and surprise you." And he loves surprise. He actually all, did the same. He's like all about surprises. He uh, totally tricked me. He was like, because he's from Phoenix, and one of the last shows Phoenix played was in Phoenix, and he was like, "Oh, I have a friend who's into metal who lives in Phoenix. What's the details for your show?" I was like, cool, whatever. And then, of course, in he walks. Like, he just loves doing shit like that. Like, he happened to be visiting home. And I was like, motherfucker. Um, so, yeah. That's a side nice. tangent, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, you mentioned, you know, as far as uh, with with the, the, the tryouts and with read-throughs and different things, in an initial two-and-a-half-hour meeting that you've mentioned that you had with the creators, uh, what were maybe even initial – uh, 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 concerns that were expressed about the role or on the other end of that, what were different attributes that you felt like that you could possibly bring to the role that no one else could? Yeah. I mean, I think it was always the thing of like, again, when you're, we're balancing comedy and drama and making this as real as possible. Um, there was a lot to talk about and uh, you know, a lot of it was just also just talking about like, and I think what I, I will say what I, maybe brought to it that, that I think reassured them was like my own experiences with people on the spectrum, um, which I have a lot in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, yeah, I mean, several different, you know, people in my life and friends of mine are on the spectrum and uh, even from a very, very young age. And so I think like, you know, there was, there was that, which was a big help. Um, not that again, every person on the spectrum is at all alike, but like, I think just, you know, having been in that world and, and known even, you know, families of people, you know, friends with siblings and whatever. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I don't know exactly what convinced them because uh, I don't understand why anyone is uh, all that convinced by me when they meet me. But, like, um, <laughs> yeah, we just, we kind of just talked about everything in life and um, what we liked, what we didn't like, shows we liked and didn't like. Um, and, uh yeah, I don't know. It was a wild meeting. 
Okay. All right. You, and you mentioned the, the audition process as far as spanning over, you know, the, the span of, you know, a course of months. Uh, within this time, did your approach to Sam alter in any way from your initial presentation to what fans ended up seeing in those first episodes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, not like drastically. I think there was something in my first read that they were like, okay, he gets it, you know, keep pushing for this. But then it was like, you know, just little adjustments, you know, they'd be like, uh, sorry, this is sideways. Uh, you know, they'd be like, okay, we're going to try one that's a little more broad or like it's a little, you know, it's almost like they were still figuring out the tone of the show. And so it was like, I was having to adjust to like what they, they wanted to see that they could possibly like change the tone of the show and have it work still. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think at its core, you know, the way I played Sam didn't change too, too much. Um, but it was more so like the world around Sam. So it was like, this is Sam in a more broad comedy or like, this is like a paced up version or, um, maybe this one, it's like, let's just take all the comedy out. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. It definitely changed a lot, but you know, they want to make sure that they, that you're going to be able to handle what they can throw at you as well. Like as they're figuring out what the show is going to be, you know, they need to know that you can kind of play ball. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I remember in one of your interviews, you had mentioned as far as, you know, consistency being a, a major factor and a major thing in, you know, your approach with playing Sam. What were some specifics as far as that you made sure to maintain as far as consistency with, with the role, especially when returning from breaks, as far as maybe even mannerisms or reactions or expressions, uh, you know, things that you, you know, consciously kept in the back of your mind. Like I have to remember to kind of keep this, keep this up. Oh, yeah, no, um, I mean, especially coming back after, you know, we mostly, I think almost every season we had at least a year between, like, wrapping and starting the new season. It was a really long time. And so, you know, oh, I had wow. to, like, rewatch episodes and be like, okay, what did I do? And then it was like, you know, thankfully I had a lot of help, too. I mean, it wasn't just me. You know, people reminding me of things, like, because, yeah, you, you, you know, you're getting back in there and there's a million things going on, too. It's so hard to focus at times on set. And, you know, someone would be like, hey, like, you know, like Jess from Props, who's an incredible props master, would be like, here's your pencil. Oh, right. Of course. Got to have it in my pocket. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay. uh, rubber band pencil, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of reminding myself, like, um, okay, so in this scene, what stress level is Sam at? And how, how are we going to decide? And then it was like a, a discussion, like, what do you guys think? Do you think, you know, uh, if, if he's, he's getting stressed, how do we show that and like at what point in the scene does it let's say like go over and he starts let's say you know pulling at his hair or something like that and like sometimes mm -hmm. they'd be like what about here and i'm like i think it's a little too early what about here um but yeah there's there's a lot it's like you know kind yeah. of relearning a whole thing and, and 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 it got easier i think as you we went along like i think um the last season was probably the easiest because i mean I've already done 28 episodes as Sam, <laughs> but even so it's like, it's always, you know, I'm like, all oh, right, okay. I got to remember that. Like, okay. And I all even catch myself doing a take and I'll be like, what the, what am I doing? Like, we need to do that again. Like I, that was my, that was me, you know, I was way too much here in that. Um, sorry. You know, sometimes also it's like six in the morning and you know, <laughs> you're just like drinking your first coffee and you're like, you know, give me a minute. I need to redo that. And that was cool. Like everyone was so cool about that. Um, you know, and kind of let me decide ultimately if like we were good to move on, you know? Mm -hmm. Nice. It, it, and, and I guess lastly with that, and this isn't really necessarily anything I, I had prepped, but you know, with it just being the, the four seasons and a little bit shorter, it still felt like by the end it was fulfilling. It was a story that it wasn't, you know, a whole lot more, you know, grasped. Obviously I think fans want more. Um, but I think it was one of those things that by the end, you know, it was, you know, it, it was fulfilling to have the ending that we did, you know, you know, be able to move on and, you know, kind of grasp onto different things that, you know, uh, particular actors or directors, you know, with the project, uh, you know, ha have done since or are going to be doing in the future. Uh, was that something, you know, on, on your end as well that you that you, you know, were, were very happy as far as when the end came about and, you know, kind of the, the final moments of the show? Yeah, um, you know, I. Uh... I, I'm a big fan of, like, British TV. Like, I think two, three, maybe four seasons, and you've told the story. 
Um, I'm not a fan of especially like a lot of American television where it's like 24 episodes and like eight yeah. seasons. I just don't think anything really can be all that interesting or cons like consistently good for that long. And I think stories have a beginning and they have an end. Um, and uh, so I, I was like, four seasons was great for me. I think, you know, I also, uh, it was great because we knew going into it that it was going to be the, the last season, which I think like when I was on uh, the United States of Terra, like we didn't know, we thought like we had another season coming. So it felt like we kind of got cut short, but with this, you know, oh, it was established. Right. They were like, you're getting one more season. <clears throat> 10 more episodes and it's going to end. And so I think going into it, knowing that was, was good. It was like, okay, this is like, this is it. Um, uh, and I, I, I think it ended on a great note. I mean, I never thought, I guess I can't spoil too much, but I never right, thought right. Uh, that Sam would actually accomplish all the things that, that he accomplished. Um, and so it was, it was great. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy with it. And, and again, I think everything needs to end. Like some people, you know, they want things to last forever. I understand. I, I agree. But I'm like, no, you know, it's like sometimes some, you know, horror movies. Like I, you know, I don't, I only really love the first three Dawn of the Dead movies. Land of the Dead's pretty cool too, but like, you know, mm -hmm. after a certain point, I'm like, eh, I'm good. For me, it ends with like Day of the Dead, maybe Land of the Dead, but that's it, you know. Yeah, 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 for sure. You know, and I think it, it comes into two with uh, with certain times, you know, how there's that special flame and you have that, you know, uh, original cast or people that are, you know, behind the cameras and then you start losing some of those people or, you know, slowly. That's where, you know, all of a sudden things just kind of diminish a little bit. And I think it's nice to have that and to, you know, be able to say, okay, this is the end and this is where, you know, we're going to finalize the chapter and uh, hope you enjoy, you know. So I, I appreciate that, you know, I, I love that too, so. That's yeah, good yeah, it's, for sure. It's, it's got to be, you know, it's like, you know, no, nothing can last forever. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Look, this is, I, I, you know, I'm already a little bit over our hours here. I don't want to take up a whole ton of your time or your day here. This has been absolutely amazing. Uh, I do have one finale, but this is your opportunity as far as to let everybody know, you know, maybe some things that you have coming up. Uh, anything new with the, either of the bands, whether you're recording or in the process of booking some shows. Uh, this is your time, my man. Uh, yeah. Um, as far as stuff coming up, I, uh, just joined the cast of, uh, this HBO, uh, what is it? Max? HBO Max. Uh, show called Love and Death I'm really excited about. Um, oh, sweet. So, uh, yeah, that's coming up. Um, that'll be the next thing I do film wise or TV wise, whatever. It's a limited series. And then, uh, music wise, like we have some stuff written. It's just been so hard, like, you know, um, just getting back into music. Um, we would definitely like to do another Phalanx album uh, and have, you know, been, you know, working on stuff. Uh, well, we have a partially recorded album, um, but yeah, it's hard. Oh, like, dang. Like, yeah, life gets in the way, but um, hopefully, you know, they will, they will get done. We, we never like scrap stuff, you know, we always finish what we start. Um, I know some bands that I'm like, sure. they'll just like scrap a whole LP and I'm like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> you know, like some of my friends have written some incredible stuff and then just been like, nah, whatever. Um, and that always pissed me off. But yeah, so well, there'll be more music coming. <laughs> and then as far as shows too, I don't know. I mean, it's like such an interesting time right now. Sorry, we've been talking about maybe doing some uh, shows here and there, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's... It's a good balance as far as keeping in mind, too, because I, I, you know, myself playing in a band, it's always a conversation of like, well, what is safe right now? You know, as far as like, yeah, you know, personally and selfishly, I want to go out and I want to travel and I want to play shows and, you know, do this or this. But, uh, you know, you try to think of as far as even if not yourself, you know, wearing a mask, like all the people that, you know, might end up attending or some of the people that might end up attending, you know, people getting sick. And it is hard right now, you know, as far as all that, too. So, I mean hopefully something with like some studio timer, at least being able to practice and, you know, hang out with the, with the friends and, and being able to play music, you know, should, uh, that, that, that's always suffice too. shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah, it'll just be good to like do anything, but I would, I mean, I love playing live. I've always been really about playing live. Like to me, that's a big part of it. Um, yeah. and, uh, I can't wait till it's like fully safe and maybe if enough, you know, the vaccination rates get to a certain point, you know, we'll, it'll be truly safe enough to like play without any of those concerns, but uh, it is a hard one right now. We'll see. I mean, it's like everything changes every five minutes. It's like all of a sudden it's yeah. like, we're good. And it's like, no, we're not. And 
So you know, even with film too, it's like our restrictions and COVID rules and everything changed every like five minutes. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, weird, it's a weird world to make plans in right, right. now. But uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah. Totally, man. Totally. All right. Really quick here, if, if you don't mind, do you, do you have a minute more? Yes. This, uh, yeah. this, okay. I just wanted to make sure. I was to say, if you had to run, I, I completely understand. No, the one uh, thing is my phone is dying, so, but I oh, will go until okay. it dies. Yeah. All, right. All right. Well, you, you had mentioned in another interview, you mentioned this bad boy here, Alice, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, Jan Sankmeyer's work, and it kind of brought me into the idea of having, uh, you know, a, a movie that might be portrayed as a kid's movie with some, some creepy content. And I wanted to dig into three movies and just to see, A, if you've seen them and what you thought of them or if you ever heard of them. So the first one here I wanted to ask you about was The Watcher in the Woods. Have you ever seen that bad boy? No. No, that looks cool. Though. It's a Disney movie. It's a Disney movie. It's from, I think, the, if not early 90s, the 80s. Uh, Anchor Bay released it, which they've released tons of horror stuff. Uh, but initially, it gets released, and it there's tons of creepy shit about this family that moves into this house, and there's these uh, uh, ghosts and apparitions out in the woods that it's it's too much for kids. <laughs> but it was always oh, portrayed yeah. to be a kids movie. <laughs> I want to check that out. I love that stuff. Yeah, that, that movie's that movie's sick. So that that's my first recommendation. My next one I wanted to ask you about is the old Ernest Scared Stupid. You ever watch that one? I think so. Is it? <laughs> Is it dark? I don't remember it being dark. Is it? It's got like these trolls in it, and the trolls when they grab the kids, oh, it yeah. turns them into these wooden dolls. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, the, I mean, there's just some moments where it's like it just doesn't seem like it's necessarily for little kids, and uh, certainly has some creepy elements to it. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, I forgot about that. Yeah, that movie is creepy. I'm not curious. What's, that movie, what's the next one? What's the next? The, one? That movie okay. rules. All right, the next one here. So you mentioned Jan Spankmar. I had to ask about this one. This is where this was all going. It's called oh, Little, little Old Tick. Tick. Yep, yep. Dude. That movie's dope. That movie's dope. Oh, man. I, I yep. love that you at least knew this one. That's fucking awesome. So you have yeah. seen that movie then? Yeah, I've seen that one. Um, and, I, yeah, the only one I hadn't seen was the first one. Um, and I'll ask you, I, now that I'm thinking about weird creepy movies, so I was just talking to my partner about this. Um, have you seen Return to Oz? Oh, my God. Yes, dude. There is uh, That is the weirdest shit. shit. <laughs> Scared <laughs> shit out of me as a kid like the scene with the heads like oh my god <laughs> right. and the wheelers and shit like oh yeah yeah that's another one that like there were some weird uh kids movies made that like i kind of wish there was more stuff like that now but there was a kind of a great <laughs> like late 80s early 90s like really weird dark stuff so oh um, yeah yeah, I mean, even like Dark Crystal, you know, you have movies like yeah. that, that where like Jim Henson type things that they just embody, you know, so much spirit and, and imagination. But also you look at stuff and you're like, what the hell were they? At? You know, I mean, obviously they were on some shit, but it's like, man, this this stuff's pretty, uh, pretty creepy when you look at it close. Shit. Yeah, no. And it's funny because I think kids do love that. Like, I loved all those kind of movies. Like, me I too. Think kids love getting scared. Like, it's a natural, you know, fun thing. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes I'm just like, who made that call? Like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, that'll, yeah. that'll be a hit. But uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good one. Another weird one, I'll just say, I'm, I'm thinking about it, is Baron Munchausen. I loved that movie as a kid. Uh, it's Terry Gilliam. I think I know that one. It's crazy. It's like truly one of the craziest. It's not really a kid's movie or an adult's movie, but it's got like Robin Williams as like a flying head in space. And like... Um, weird. It's crazy. Huh. Check that one. Yeah, Return to Oz and those that and Baron Munchausen are two that I'm also like really Baron weird Munchausen. sort of okay. kids movies. Yeah, check it out. Damn. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Look, man, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so so much. Uh, I appreciate the time, and uh, I'll cut you loose before the phone dies, my man. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. You stay healthy and stay uh, stay safe, my man. You take care. Yeah. You too. All right. Bye. -bye. Peace. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.